Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, June 6, 2024. World leaders gather near the beaches of Normandy, France on this 80th anniversary of D-Day, the pivotal military operation during World War II to defeat Nazi Germany. There's praise for the brave soldiers who fought that day, some of whom attended today's ceremonies, and warnings about modern-day authoritarian threats. Exhibit A, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Coming up, we hear from President Joe Biden, French President Emmanuel Macron, King Charles III of Great Britain, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, plus some of the U.S. members of Congress who traveled to France. And in the United States, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin at the National D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia, and Toby Roosevelt, great-grandson of President Franklin D. Roosevelt at the World War II Memorial in Washington. Also today, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg talks about the chances that Russia would take military action against the NATO member in the next few years. State Department has asked about an Israeli airstrike on a school in Gaza where Palestinians were sheltering. It killed over 30 people, including women and children. The Israeli military says Hamas militants were operating from that school. Former President Donald Trump's White House Senior advisor Steve Bannon is given just a couple of weeks to finish any appeals on his sentence for contempt of Congress for not responding to a congressional subpoena, and if not successful, report to prison by July 1st. And Attorney General Merrick Garland talks about a drop in violent crime at a forum for chiefs of police. From CBS News, President Biden and key U.S. allies were in Normandy Thursday to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the U.S.-led Allied Forces D-Day invasion of Nazi-occupied France. The brazen air and sea invasion would mark the beginning of the end of World War II, leading to the defeat of Adolf Hitler's Nazi German forces in Europe less than a year later. Mr. Biden, French President Emmanuel Macron, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau were together to mark the most significant victory of the Western Allies in the war, as well as the largest seaborne invasion in history. That was from CBS News. This music was played at the ceremony at the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial, where 9,388 soldiers are buried. French President Emmanuel Macron honored 11 U.S. World War II veterans, some D-Day survivors, with the Legion of Honor Medal, France's highest military honor, He spoke mostly in French and said, You left everything, crossed the ocean, and landed on the coast of France eight decades ago. You left everything and risked everything for our independence, for our freedom. That we will never forget. And then at the end, he did say a line in English. Here you came to join your efforts with our own soldiers and to make France a free nation. And you are back here today at home, if I may say. French President Emmanuel Macron. President Biden, at the start of his speech, also thanked the veterans. Hitler and those with him thought democracies were weak, that the future belonged to dictators. Here, the coast of Normandy, the battle between freedom and tyranny would be joined. Here, on that June morning, the testing was at hand. President Macron, Mrs. Macron, Secretary Austin, Secretary Blinken, distinguished guests, most of all, our honored veterans who met that test at the ages, the test of ages to that moment, 80 years ago, 80 years ago today. <clears throat> On behalf of the American people and as Commander in Chief, It's the highest honor to be able to salute you here in Normandy once more. All of you, God love you. President Biden at the American Cemetery and Memorial. It was June 6, 1944. Over 150,000 Allied troops landed by sea and air. More than 4,400 were killed. President Biden in a speech also linked the fight then to a fight happening now. America's unique ability to bring countries together is an undeniable source of our strength and our power. Isolationism was not the answer 80 years ago and is not the answer today. (laughs) 
We know the dark forces that these heroes fought against 80 years ago. They never fade. Aggression and greed, the desire to dominate and control, to change borders by force, these are perennial. The struggle between a dictatorship and freedom is unending. Here in Europe, we see one stark example. Ukraine has been invaded by a tyrant bent on domination. Ukrainians are fighting with extraordinary courage, suffering great losses, but never backing down. They've been inflicted on the Russian aggressors. They've suffered tremendous losses in Russia. The numbers are staggering. 350,000 Russian troops dead or wounded. Nearly one million people have left Russia because they can no longer see a future in Russia. The United States and NATO and a coalition of more than 50 countries standing strong with Ukraine. We will not walk away. Because if we do, Ukraine will be subjugated and will not end there. Ukraine's neighbors will be threatened. All of Europe will be threatened. And make no mistake, the autocrats of the world are watching closely to see what happens in Ukraine, to see if we let this illegal aggression go unchecked. We cannot let that happen. To surrender to bullies, to bow down to dictators, is simply unthinkable. President Biden at the D-Day 80th anniversary ceremony in France. Former President Donald Trump, President Biden's expected opponent in this year's U.S. presidential election, posted on Truth Social today, We honor the immortal heroes who landed at Normandy 80 years ago. The men of D-Day will live forever in history as among the bravest, noblest, and greatest Americans ever to walk the earth. They shed their blood and thousands gave their lives in defense of American freedom. They are in our hearts today and for all time. About 20 U.S. senators and about 50 U.S. House members also made the trip to Normandy for the anniversary, and some of them posted videos. Here is Senator Eric Schmidt, Republican from Missouri. All right, I'm here for the 80th anniversary of D-Day here on Normandy Beach. We just had a a moving ceremony um, where veterans from World War II and specifically D-Day were honored um, for their heroism. I mean, these guys, 80 years ago, young men, free to continent and save the world. I'm I'm proud uh, to be the grandson of a World War II vet Um, and actually, interestingly, ran into someone here and got a chance to talk to somebody who served in the same infantry unit as my grandfather. So there's probably some cosmic uh, reason for that. But uh, on a personal level, that was very moving to talk to him about what it was like, uh, as I did with my grandfather before he passed away decades ago. But this is a day of honoring those heroes who literally saved the world. So it's an honor of a lifetime for me to represent our state and honoring them today. Senator Eric Schmidt, Republican from Missouri, from Normandy, France, part of the Senate delegation to the 80th anniversary. Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, Democrat from New Jersey, is on the Congressional Member Delegation, or CODEL, to the anniversary. She posted this video before she left Washington. Hi, this is Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, and as we commemorate D-Day, I just want to give a heartfelt thank you to all of our World War II veterans. My grandfather served in World War II and actually flew over Normandy on D-Day and was later shot down that August over occupied France. And I know the sacrifices that so many people made in that operation. I was over to celebrate the 75th anniversary of D-Day several years ago and hearing the stories of that day and the difficulty in storming those beaches and the people who gave their lives so that we could be secure in our freedom was incredibly touching and moving. Um, So thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the families um, who had loved ones in that fight and um, take care as we remember all the sacrifices that it takes to keep our country free. Thanks. Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, Democrat from New Jersey, posting that video. An article from CNN ahead of the 80th anniversary of D-Day Ceremonies reads nearly one million spectators are expected, according to the French Interior Ministry. 
but organizers and veterans themselves also acknowledge that this year could be the last major commemoration in which living veterans are able to attend. About 200 veterans from Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States are expected to make the journey, many of whom are more than 100 years old. And there were several ceremonies near the beaches in Normandy, including one that was designated 80 years ago as Juno Beach, where Canadian forces landed. And the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, was at that ceremony. To win the war, the Allied High Command decided that the coast of Normandy would be the target of the amphibious assault on the continent. Canadian infantry and armoured troops were assigned a landing zone of their own, right here at Juno Beach. It was a testament to the esteem held for Canadian soldiers that a country with such a relatively small population would be given such an important role in Operation Overlord. And Canadians proved up to the task. On this day, 80 years ago, Canadian troops progressed further inland than any of our allies. It was a remarkable achievement and a costly one, too. Honorary Lieutenant General Richard Romer, who turned 100 this year, and who is also with us today, is one of Canada's most decorated veterans. Over the decades, he's participated in and organized many commemoration events. In his words, the costly D-Day success at Juno Beach laid the unforeseeable foundation for the betterment of mankind. It is important for him that we never forget. So to General Romer, to Sergeant Armitage, who couldn't be here with us today, to able seaman Bill Cameron, who sadly passed away just last weekend. When I spoke with her a few days ago, his daughter Donna told me just how much he'd been looking forward to being here with all of you. His bags has been packed for weeks, and he was so proud to be coming back to Normandy. So for him, and for all the veterans, I can promise you that Canada and the world will keep commemorating this significant de de day for decades and generations to come. Our way of life didn't happen by accident, and it won't continue without effort. Democracy is still under threat today. It is threatened by aggressors who want to redraw borders. It is threatened by demagoguery, misinformation, disinformation, foreign interference. We must all continue to stand for democracy day in and day out. We owe it to future generations, and we owe it to the great women and men in uniform who sacrificed so much for our collective freedom, lest we forget. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at today's D-Day 80th anniversary ceremony in Normandy, France. Not far away, near the village of Verdemur at the British Normandy Memorial, a ceremony with the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, King Charles III, Prince William, and French President Emmanuel Macron. That memorial records the names of over 22,000 people from more than 30 countries under British command killed in Normandy from June 6 to August 31, 1944. King Charles said the debt can never be repaid. Eighty years ago... On D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944, our nation and those which stood alongside us faced what my grandfather, King George VI, described as the supreme test. How fortunate we were, and the entire free world, that a generation of men and women in the United Kingdom and other allied nations did not flinch when the moment came to face that test. On the beaches of Normandy, in the seas beyond, and in the skies 
overhead. Our armed forces carried out their duty with a humbling sense of resolve and determination. Qualities so characteristic of that remarkable wartime generation. Very many of them never came home. They lost their lives on the D-Day landing grounds or in the many battles that followed. It is with the most profound sense of gratitude that we remember them and all those who served at that critical time. We recall the lesson that comes to us again and again across the decades. Three nations must stand together to oppose tyranny. King Charles III at the British Normandy Memorial ceremony on this 80th anniversary of D-Day. An article from Associated Press, British paratroopers who parachuted into the historic D-Day drop zone in Normandy to recreate the airborne part of the battle, encountered something soldiers wouldn't have had to deal with 80 years ago. They had to go through French customs and passport control upon landing. Since the United Kingdom left the European Union in 2020, Britain's have had to go through border checks in France and the rest of the 27 EU member states. A makeshift border post was set up in a field where they landed. An international D-Day ceremony was held on Omaha Beach with music and dance performances, paratroopers landing on the beach, historic plane flyovers. NBC News says it was attended by some 25 heads of state and 4,500 spectators, including Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, But despite Moscow's pivotal role in World War II, the Russian delegation was uninvited to this week's events, its presence deemed untenable because of Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine. Here is French President Emmanuel Macron speaking at that international ceremony with English interpretation. Those who landed on the 6th of June were not fighting on their own land or for their own villages. They were fighting against an ideology of death. They were fighting against belief in hatred spreading everywhere, which destroyed Jews, disabled, foreigners, homosexuals, gypsies, Freemasons and communists, all those who live, who love and who think and who believe differently. De nos plages en cet instant and the silence of our beaches at that the moment is full of echoes. The, the, the noises of bullets and peuples. voices, echoes of men facing the impossible. So many people, so many Normandie. peoples. There are those who are in the cemetery, the watery cemetery, those who are under the sand in Normandy, those who are under the sea, those who are out in the the fields, those who fell in turn year after year, a long time after, elsewhere, not in Normandy, but who always remained. Those who Face fought. À la remise en cause when we look at war coming back to our continent, when we look at people questioning the values for which they fought, when we look at those who want to change borders by force to rewrite history, let us stand ici. with dignity and look Votre at those who landed here. Jour, let us have their courage. Here, President of Ukraine, your presence here today shows us this in a very forceful way. French President Emmanuel Macron threw an interpreter at the 80th anniversary of D-Day ceremony, Omaha Beach, Normandy, France. And this is Washington Today. There were also D-Day anniversary remembrances in the United States. One at the National D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia. Of the 34 Virginia National Guard soldiers from the company based in Bedford who stormed Omaha Beach 80 years ago, 19 died on the beach and a 20th was killed later that day, making Bedford the U.S.'s highest per capita D-Day loss. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin remembered their sacrifice. With the eyes of the world upon them, They embarked on the Great Crusade 
the most consequential, perhaps, ever. While the skies roared with the sounds of the battle ahead, the ocean waters below were filled with quiet prayers. They knew whatever was ahead, they would give everything. That full measure of devotion to freedom. The air condensed with anticipation. These heroic men landed on Omaha Beach and they charged. Met by a hail of enemy fire, the sky glowed red. So many fell. Brothers, brothers from this town of Bedford, one carrying a Bible that was later found. They continued on over the cliffs to confront and defeat evil. Each step was filled with faith. No matter the cost, they would secure victory. And they changed the course of history. These extraordinary, legendary heroes were drawn to the glow of freedom. Heroes like Corporate Robert Boulay of the United States Marines serving aboard the battleship USS Texas that day in support of the invasion. Heroes like Sergeant John Birch Jr., U.S. Army member of the 82nd Airborne, who dropped with glider forces as a medic during the invasion. Heroes like the 22 World War II veterans, all of whom are here with us today and honor us with their presence. Governor Glenn Youngkin, Republican from Virginia at today's D-Day 80th anniversary ceremony at the National D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia, which was dedicated in 2001. But the tradition of honoring the Bedford boys goes back to 1954 on the 10th anniversary. Also today's program in Bedford, the French Consul General, Carolyn Mamboisson. As we honor this pivotal moment in history, I want to acknowledge the immeasurable debt we owe the veterans here. You had to overcome incredible adversity and brutality to ensure that future generations in France and Europe could grow up in a free world. You left your homes and loved ones and crossed the Atlantic or served in faraway theaters, such as in, in the Pacific, to end the war and free our continent. Your courage changed the course of history. But we know that freedom came at a price. On D-Day itself, more than 4,400 Allied troops were killed, including more than 2,500 Americans. Thousands more were wounded or unaccounted for. As staggering as they are, these numbers fail to reflect the bravery and selflessness of those young men and the brutality they encountered on those beaches. None of them that set out to be a hero, but they all were. The town of Bedford, in particular, paid a heavy price. On July 17, 1944, this small community learned that 19 men had died in the D-Day landings, the country's highest loss in proportion to its population. We will never be able to repay their sacrifices, but we want to honor those brave souls who died that day and express our sincere and everlasting gratitude to their relatives. France has not forgotten, and anyone who has traveled to Normandy knows that the memories of the war are still vivid there. The Normandy American Cemetery in Colville-sur-Mer is the final resting place of 9,388 American soldiers who lost their lives during Operation Overlord. President Joe Biden was there today with French President Emmanuel Macron. Dozens of American veterans returned to Normandy to take part in the commemorations. 
Many of those who made the journey in the past few days are more than 100 years old. Crowds of people gathered to greet them with applause, cheers, and waving flags. The atmosphere was extremely emotional as both veterans and local residents of all ages were deeply moved by the significance of the moment. The French Consul General, Carolyn Mavoswan. An article in Cardinal News in Virginia reads, the National D-Day Memorial sits on just over 50 acres off Burks Hill Road, just north of Bedford Elementary School in the town of Bedford. Its signature monument is the Overlord Arch, standing 44 feet, 6 inches tall, a reference to D-Day's June 6, 1944 date. Named after the D-Day military operations code name, the Overlord Arch looms over the memorial's central exhibit a plaza that uses sculptures and a reflecting pool to symbolize the Normandy beach landings and the combat that followed. Popping jets of air in the water simulate gunfire. Surrounding the plaza is a wall with bronze plaques bearing the names of more than 4,400 Allied service members who died on D-Day. The Memorial Foundation's research into the dead continues to this day. Three new names were added to the wall just this past Memorial Day, and more will be unveiled on Thursday. That article from Cardinal News. In Washington, D.C., the organization Friends of the National World War II Memorial hosted a ceremony commemorating the 80th anniversary of D-Day on the main plaza of the memorial. They presented two D-Day veterans, James Elsner Berend and retired Army Colonel Frank Cohn, with 2024 Greatest Generation Commemorative Coins. One of the speakers at today's ceremony, Elliot Toby Roosevelt III, the great-grandson of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. On June 6, 1944, I, of course, had not been born. My father was seven years old, and it is likely if he had not yet gone to bed on a ranch southwest of Fort Worth, Texas, he listened to his grandfather pray before the country that evening. Among its many legacies, the Normandy landings represent the delivery of humankind to a better world, where people reaffirmed at great cost the central ideas of human dignity, liberty, and the rule of law, the ideas upon which this country was founded. At a time when the outcome of the great contest to sustain those values hung in the balance, the President of the United States chose not to make a speech, but with the people of this nation to make a solemn request of the Almighty, a decision reflecting a worldview defined by humble acknowledgement of the limits of man and of man's ultimate dependence upon a just, all-powerful, loving God. For those like me, who have always lived within the light of that war's transcendent outcome, it is all too common to never have grasped or to never have been taught the central character of World War II. The United States and its allies face a real, here and now today, existential threat. If we lost, we would live under the jackboot of Nazism. It was a fear those born later have never known. As such, FDR's D-Day prayer reminds us that the ideas which undergird our lives and which we take as givens are not givens at all. That despite this country's great strengths, as an embodiment of those ideas, the United States remains a delicate experiment. Elliot Toby Roosevelt III, the great-grandson of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, today at the National World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., on this 80th anniversary of D-Day. Thirty years ago on this date, June 6, 1994, on the 50th anniversary of D-Day, C-SPAN interviewed D-Day veteran Henry Bardock, 82nd Airborne Division. Let me ask you, Henry Bardock, what you think um, the values are that should be commemorated with regards to D-Day? Well, one value in particular is the, the spirit uh, of 
cooperation, the determination uh, of all the soldiers, the Allied soldiers, to get on with this and to, in the briefly said, stated, the, to win the war. Uh, I feel that D-Day really, although it stands for the day, really should stand for determination because I think there was a, a, a wonderful spirit. It's a spirit that perhaps in quite in that same way doesn't exist anymore today. But at that time, there, the American soldiers, uh, many of them had never been to Europe before. Uh, many of them were quite, quite new. Uh, nevertheless, the young people understood very well what was at stake. And this is, uh, uh, there was an objective, there was a feeling of nationalism, if you will, that uh, was very, very commendable. Henry Bardock, D-Day veteran, served in the 82nd Airborne Division on C-SPAN, June 6, 1994, 50th anniversary of D-Day. That from C-SPAN's video library. And a few more tweets from U.S. Senators on this 80th anniversary. John Bozeman, Republican of Arkansas. It was an incredible honor to attend today's ceremony in Normandy commemorating the 80th anniversary of D-Day in the company of the veterans who stormed these beaches and among the final resting place of their fallen brothers in arms. We must never forget them and what they did. And from Senator Debbie Stabenow, Democrat from Michigan, 80 years ago, brave American troops and their allies stormed the beaches of Normandy to liberate Europe from the Nazis. Today we honor and remember their bravery, sacrifices, and willingness to protect our nation. Washington Today continues in a moment. C-SPAN, where history unfolds daily. In 1979, C-SPAN was created as a public service by America's cable television companies. And today, we continue to take you to Congress and other public policy events in Washington, D.C. and around the country. C-SPAN, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. Story from the New York Times, President Vladimir V. Putin of Russia warned on Wednesday that Western nations supplying Ukraine with long-range missiles and allowing them to be used to attack inside Russia was a dangerous step that could prompt Moscow to reciprocate against Western targets. Mr. Putin said at a news conference, if someone thinks it possible to send such weapons to a war zone to strike our territory and create problems for us, then why do we not have the right to send our weapons of the same class to those regions of the world where strikes can be made on sensitive facilities of the countries that do this against Russia? Mr. Putin singled out Germany. That from the New York Times. Today, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg held a news conference with the president of Finland, President Alexander Stubb, in Helsinki. It's the secretary's first visit to Finland since that country joined NATO. They were asked by a reporter about the threat posed by Russia to NATO countries. A question for both Lauri Nurmi from the Finnish newspaper Iltalehti. The commander of the Norwegian Defense Forces, General Erik Kristoffersen, said in Bloomberg's interview that NATO has only two to three years time prepare for Russian risk, even an attack. I would like to hear your comments on that and the time frame. And first of all, uh, is that a real threat that uh, the Russians could attack on NATO countries, for example, Norway, Finland, Baltic nations, after they have rebuilt their, their capabilities? We have heard so many, wa- so many warnings done by high-ranked military commanders. Thank you. So we, we don't see any imminent uh, military threat against any NATO ally. And uh, uh, now, of course, Russia is more than preoccupied with the war uh, in Ukraine. They actually moved a lot of forces uh, from the vicinity of the, uh, on Finland, the, the Nordic countries, uh, down to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, then, of course, when the fighting ends uh, in Ukraine, um, they can uh, rebuild uh, those uh, forces. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that we see any danger for imminent attack against any NATO ally, because NATO is 50% of the world's military might. NATO is the strongest alliance military power in the world. Uh, And the purpose of standing together, uh, one for all, all for one, uh, our collective defense clause, Article 5, is to prevent an attack. And uh, for 75 years, NATO has done exactly that. So this uh, this idea that uh, there's a kind of countdown uh, to to the next war is wrong. Uh, we are there to 
prevent that from happening, we have done so for 75 years, we will do it for at least 75 years more. I fully agree with the Secretary General and I would like to mitigate the rhetoric that we quite often see uh, in today's world. The alternative cost of Russia to deviate from its current attack on Ukraine is way too high. Does this mean that we're not prepared? Of course not. The best way to prepare, the best way to prevent war is to prepare for it. But the whole idea that a country like Russia would somehow attack or intimidate the biggest military alliance uh, in the world, um, I simply find rather implausible. We look at different scenarios every day, every week, every month. We have our operational plannings, which are based on realities, which are based on knowledge of what the Russians uh, are doing, what they could do, but we simply do not see it in the cards that there would be a military threat right now to Finland, Sweden, Norway, uh, or the Baltic states as such. The president of Finland, Alexander Stubb, along with the NATO Secretary General Jans Stoltenberg, joint news conference in Helsinki. Story from AP, the U.S. has been tracking Russian warships and aircraft that are expected to arrive in the Caribbean for a military exercise in the coming weeks in a Russian show of force as tensions rise over Western military support for Ukraine. U.S. officials said Wednesday the ships also are expected possibly to make port calls in Venezuela and Cuba as Russia establishes a Western Hemisphere military presence that the senior Biden administration officials quoted in the article said was notable but not concerning. From the Washington Post, Israeli fighter jets appear to have used U.S.-made munitions in a strike that killed dozens of people inside a U.N. school in the central Gaza Strip on Thursday, according to two weapons experts who examined verified footage from the debris. An Israeli Defense Forces spokesman said the strikes targeted a gathering of militants at the school, but the facility was also packed with thousands of civilians displaced by the war, according to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, which aids Palestinian refugees. That was an article at the Washington Post. The U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller was asked by reporters at his news conference about this attack. And then can I ask on this deadly Israeli strike on a school that was housing IDPs in Gaza, what's your response to that? So we have been in contact with the government of Israel about this strike. They have said to us essentially what they have said publicly, which is that, uh, and this is this is th- their claim, that they were targeting 20 to 30 uh, members of Hamas and other militant groups, that they used a precision strike uh, to target only one part of the building without um, uh, hitting areas where civilians uh, we're sheltering. At the same time, we've seen the reports on the ground. We've seen the videos from the ground. We've seen the claims that 14 children were killed in this strike. And certainly when um, you see if that is accurate, that 14 children uh, were killed, th- those aren't terrorists. And so the government of Israel has said that they're going to release more information about this strike, including the names of those uh, who died in it. We expect them to be fully transparent uh, in making that information public. Were U.S. weapons used in this strike? I don't have any update uh, to that. I'd refer to the government of Israel to that question. question, How does this not cross the red line that the president laid out, you know, several weeks ago? This is the second incident in less than two weeks where we've seen a pretty large civilian toll on what was supposed to be a precision strike. So with respect to the policy that the president announced, he was speaking specifically to a large scale operation in Rafa. And we have not yet seen a large scale operation conducted in Rafa. That said, um, we have seen strikes that put civilians in danger well before the president said that, and we have made clear to the government of Israel that we expect them to do everything that they can to minimize civilian harm. Um, We've been through this before. It applies in this situation, too. It is a difficult situation if it is true that you have this site where Hamas is hiding inside a school, other militants are hiding inside a school, those individuals are legitimate targets, but at the same time, they're embedded near civilians. Israel has a right to try and target those civilians, but they also have the obligation to minimize civilian harm and take every step possible to minimize civilian harm. So that's why we were pressing uh, uh, the government of Israel and the IDF to be completely transparent about what happened here. We want to know the facts uh, uh, as much as anyone. Have they taken every step possible? Uh, we have seen them take improvements over over time, but still, if it if it bears true that this strike resulted in the death of 14 children, the results aren't where they need to be. So it gets back to this question of intent and results. Even if the intent is what the uh, IDF has said publicly that they were trying to hit use a precision sh- precision strike just to target. 20 to 30 militants. If you have seen 14 children die in that strike, that shows that something went wrong. That said, 
These are all facts that need to be verified, and that's what we want to see happen. U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller at his news conference in Washington. From AP, Philip Lazzarini, the commissioner general at UNRWA, said in a post on X that 6,000 people were sheltering in the school when it was hit without prior warning. He said UNRWA was unable to verify claims that armed groups were inside. UNRWA schools across Gaza have functioned as shelters since the start of the war, which has driven most of the territory's population of 2.3 million Palestinians from their homes. That was from AP. This is Washington Today. From CNN, a federal judge on Thursday ordered Steve Bannon to report to prison by July 1st, giving the former Donald Trump advisor a short window to get a higher court's intervention. Bannon was convicted of contempt of Congress in 2022 after failing to provide documents and testimony to the House Select Committee that investigated the January 6, 2021 U.S. Capitol attack. He was sentenced to four months in prison. The federal judge presiding over the case, Carl Nichols, had initially paused the sentence while Bannon appealed the conviction. Last month, however, a D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals panel unanimously rejected several challenges Bannon made to the case, and prosecutors immediately asked Nichols to send Bannon to prison to begin serving his sentence. That was from CNN. Steve Bannon spoke to reporters outside the courthouse today in Washington. I've got great lawyers, and we're going to go all the way to the Supreme Court if we have to, but I want to say something specifically about the Justice Department. Merrick Garland, Lisa Monaco, the entire Justice Department, they're not going to shut up Trump. They're not going to shut up Navarro. They're not going to shut up Bannon, and they're certainly not going to shut up MAGA. If you look right here, you reporters, in the two and a half or three years we've been here, look at the rise of MAGA, look at the rise of Donald Trump. If the election was heard, held today, according to Harry Enten over at CNN, President Trump would win in a landslide. All of this, besides the major legal issues that have to be addressed, all of this is about one thing. This is about shutting down the MAGA movement, shutting down grassroots conservatives, shutting down President Trump. Not only are we winning, we are going to prevail, and every number and every poll shows that. There's nothing that can shut me up and nothing that will shut me up. There's not a prison, there's not a prison, there's not a prison built. There's not a prison built or jail built that will ever shut me up. All victory to MAGA. We're going to win this. We're going to win at the Supreme Court. And more importantly, we're going to win on November 5th in an amazing landslide with the Senate, the House, and also Donald J. Trump back as President of the United States. Thank you very much. Steve Bannon, former White House advisor in the Donald Trump administration, speaking today outside the courthouse in Washington, D.C. The U.S. Supreme Court issued some opinions today, but not on the cases involving presidential immunity for Donald Trump and potentially other presidents. And there's another case about what charges can be brought against January 6th attack defendants. From Associated Press, the court sided with Native American tribes in a dispute with the federal government over the cost of health care when tribes run programs in their own communities. The 5-4 to decision means the government will cover millions in overhead costs that two tribes faced when they took over running their health care programs under a law meant to give Native Americans more local control. Attorney General Merrick Garland delivered remarks today on the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives' third annual Chiefs of Police Executive Forum on Crime Guns. The Attorney General said that violent crime has been falling. Our shared commitment to deepening our partnerships into the public we serve has already begun to show results. FBI data shows a decrease in violent crime in communities across the country in 2023 compared to the previous year, including an over 13 percent reduction in homicides. That's the steepest decline, yearly decline in homicides in over 50 years. And last year's trend appears to be continuing into this year. Based on data from police departments in 90 cities across the country, we saw an 18% year-over-year decline in murders in the first quarter of 2024. That That progress is reflected in some of the communities represented here today. In Atlanta, there was a 21% drop in homicides in 2023. In San Antonio, there was a nearly 29% drop in homicides and a 10% decrease in overall violent crime. And in Philadelphia, there was a 20% decline in homicides. This progress is thanks 
first and foremost to the brave men and women in your departments who put their lives on the line to protect their communities every day. We know that there are families that did not lose a loved one because of the brave efforts of your officers. We also know that our work is far from over. There is no acceptable level of violent crime. Violent crime not only threatens people's safety, it threatens their ability to go about their daily lives. And needless to say in this room, violent crime endangers the law enforcement officers who risk their lives every single day to protect their communities. It has been a particularly tough year for law enforcement. According to the FBI, 2023 marked a 10-year high for the number of officers assaulted or injured by firearms. 60 officers were feloniously killed in the line of duty. I know that none of us will give up until that number is zero. Attorney General Merrick Garland at an ATF forum on crime guns for chiefs of police held in Washington, D.C. Wall Street today, the Dow up 78, NASDAQ down 14, and S&P down 1. A story from CNN, the European Central Bank cut interest rates Thursday, moving before the U.S. Federal Reserve and the Bank of England to lower borrowing costs as inflation recedes following years of rate hikes. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.